All right, so welcome. We're going to talk today about our photopolymerization labs. So this is one of the labs that we're running uh, in the organic chemistry sequence. And so the main thing about this lab is we'll be making polymers, so making large molecules. And we'll discuss what that means. And we'll be also using photochemistry or light to make this um, process happen much better. Okay, so the main thing is, what do we mean by polymerization? What are these polymers um, that we are going to be making in this lab? And so what that really is, is a process that takes lots of smaller units and links them together through polymerization to larger molecules. Right? So here on the left, um, these light green spheres are representing individual um, monomers or smaller units which through polymerization we link together to larger molecules like shown here. So we take lots of small units, link them together to make a smaller number of substantially larger or higher molecular weight molecules. Okay, so that's the process of polymerization, taking small units, linking them together to larger or so-called macromolecules. Um, polymerization is a very large industrial process. Um, in fact, in everyday life, we're constantly using and both synthetic and naturally occurring polymers um, in many, many situations. So for example, naturally occurring polymers that we may interact with. Um, so things like starch, for instance, in a lot of food products um, is actually a polymer of glucose. Um, cellulose is also a polymer of glucose. Um, the difference is the actual orientation of the glucose chains changes the properties of these molecules quite substantially, but so cellulose is common in, uh, for instance, things like wood products and paper products. Um, proteins are examples of polymers that are made up of smaller units like amino acids. Chitosan is commonly um, found in certain types of biological media. Lignin is used in um, plant-based media to help hold um, you know, larger parts of the structures together. So these are all common examples of naturally occurring polymers. Um, and so these have been used for thousands of years, um, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Now, on the other hand, there's also synthetic polymers or polymers made using chemistry methods. And so these include things like polyethylene, which is the largest by volume polymer out there, which is commonly used in things like containers, um, plastic film wrap, those sorts of things. Polypropylene is also up there. Also using a lot of things like containers, plastic chairs are made often of polypropylene, etc. Um, PET, also called polyester or polyethylene terephthalate. Um, those are using things like plastic water bottles. Also polyester clothing is um, often made of PET. Um, polystyrene, commonly used in packaging. Paints also um, to help form um, a film that you can spread on a wall or on a canvas. Those are often based on synthetic polymers. So these have many, many uses um, throughout the world. Okay, so main takeaway from this polymerization is this idea of taking lots of smaller molecules and linking them together to larger structures. And there's examples of synthetic and naturally occurring polymers. <clears throat> now the classes of polymers, we generally differentiate between two types of polymers and one of them is called thermosets. And the other one is thermoplastics. Okay, so thermoplastics are still large molecules. They're long chain molecules, but those long chains are not linked together typically through covalent bonds. Okay, so they're individual long molecules, not globally one molecule. Okay, so an example of um, what happens in thermoplastics is you heat them up to a certain temperature and they melt and they basically flow and this helps processing and this is why it's um, relatively easy to make bottles of different shapes and sizes out of um, thermoplastics and be that poly um, ethylene polystyrene pet these are all thermoplastic polymers they're individual chains when we heat them up enough those chains can move around and so you can reshape them it's a little bit different to thermosets thermosets are uh, globally covalent crossing. Every molecule in a thermoset is linked to every other monomer, every other part of the thermoset in principle. So you have this large, expansive network of structures. So it's very similar in that way 
um, conceptually to crystalline solids such as, say, diamond. But unlike diamond, where there's a perfect order to how the atoms are arranged, in thermoset polymers, there's still that three-dimensional network, but it's nowhere near as regular. But what this means is in a thermoset, if you heat it up enough, it can get softer, but it will never float. It will always keep its shape. And so examples of these include things like um, rubbers, such as, for instance, in tires, contact lenses. These are all examples um, of thermoset polymers. They keep their shape under you know, essentially all practical conditions. Okay, and that's because they're linked together, like shown here, to larger structures where every bond, uh, every atom is essentially linked through some covalent pathway to every other atom in the thermoset. Okay. So within this space of thermosets, and in this lab, we'll be going ahead and making some um, thermoset polymers. Um, all thermosets have these chains linked together, but the density of a number of cross-linking points can be a bit different. Okay, so if we change the density or the concentration of these cross-links, we'll change the properties of the polymer material, right? So here we have on the left something shown which has relatively more cross-linkers per unit volume. And on the right, in this structure here, we have fewer cross-linkers per unit volume. And so these two would have different properties, and that's one of the things we'll be exploring. Okay, so one of the most commonly used methods and one of the most accessible methods for making synthetic polymers is radical polymerization. This idea of taking our monomers, okay, providing a radical source, so that can be something like a peroxide, that can be something like a um, azo compound, or in uh, this particular case, we'll be using um, compounds that generate radicals under light. We'll use those radicals to help stitch or attach these molecules together to give you a larger structure. Okay, so the main concept of radical polymerization, most cases, radical polymerization takes advantage of monomers that contain a double bond or an alkene type unit, right? And this double bond contains one sigma, one pi bond. When we give it um, a radical source, we link it together to a larger structure. It's what we represent with this N. But notice here, everything is single bonds or sigma bonds. So the idea is we'll convert a pi bond and a sigma bond in the monomer to two sigma bonds, right? So we essentially exchange a pi bond to a sigma bond. And that's important um, for the you know, reason why these polymerizations are so efficient. The other thing that's fantastic about radicals is radicals are very tolerant to the types of functional groups we can use and the reaction conditions. Okay, so um, sort of last thing we'll kind of touch on in this, uh, in this introductory uh, video is photopolymerization. So a lot of the time we want to be able to control when polymerization happens. We don't want to have uh, polymerization happen, say, in transit from the plant that makes the monomers to the um, site where we're going to actually polymerize the monomers. We don't want it polymerizing in transit. We want to be able to control when it happens under controlled conditions. And so what we often do is we'll use a um, either temperature responsive radical source in the case of radical polymerization or a light responsive radical source so that when we don't heat it or we have it in the dark, there's very few, if any, radicals being generated. So the polymerization really um, does not happen to any appreciable extent. But in the case of photopolymerization, we use a compound which is sensitive to light. And so when we turn on the light, our photo initiator, a compound that's sensitive to light, breaks up and generates radicals which can start the polymerization process. And that way we can actually um, control when the polymerization is happening. Um, now, one of the things we'll be exploring is different types of light sources and sort of recalling from general chemistry, right? Different colors of light, different wavelengths of light have different energies. And so we'll be looking at aligning the energy levels of the molecule, the initiator with the light source, and we'll see what's an effective way of um, doing that in practice. All right. 
So good luck with the lamb this week.